this part of the kernel track, but I'm actually, it's actually a bit of a lie. I'm not going to talk about the kernel at all. Uh, the kernel is what comes afterwards. So, um, I work for the Intel Open Source Technology Center, uh, but it, this is not an Intel project. So, don't blame them for, for that. This, they, they also like me to put this up, so. <laughs> Syslinux, as of right now, is a suite of bootloaders. It currently consists of four what I call derivatives. Um, this is a bit of a legacy term from when the differences between them was much bigger in terms of code. It really comes down to different file system support. The original syslinux, in all caps, just to be extra confusing, is for FAT file systems, uh, MS-DOS file systems. This uh, was originally done for boot floppies. Follow that came network booting in, uh, in PXE Linux. This is named after the PXE standard, which is the standard for network booting on x86. Uh, followed that was ISO Linux, uh, boots from CD-ROMs. This is, of course, from the ISO 9660 file system. And most recently, EXT Linux, as a general purpose bootloader loads from Linux ext2, ext3 file systems. And I promised Ted that I'm going to get ext4 in there really soon now. Uh, right now, this is only supports the x86 BIOS platform. And this dates back from when this was designed for boot floppies. Uh, size mattered tremendously. Uh, a floppy isn't very big, so any overhead not being left for the kernel was a major problem. So the solution was to make it as small as possible, and that meant assembly language. Um, this has since become a liability uh, in terms of support uh, and maintainability, so we're uh, I am very much trying to get as much code out of the assembly as possible. We have several sophisticated menu systems. Some of them aren't even written by me. And perhaps most important, uh, this is, uh, SysLinux has been designed with a mo extensible, it's extensible via a module API. It also contains a couple of additional pieces, which are useful for some people. Memdisk is a disk emulator. Uh, it loads a chunk of memory, just as has been a kernel, and then allows the booting of a any operating system that still uses the BIOS, or for that matter, another boot. It can even be used to load another bootloader. It's frequently used for diagnostics. Um, it contains gpixie Linux, which is a collaboration with the Etherboot project, whose flagship product is gpixie. This is, as you, prob as you may be able to tell from the name, an open source PXE stack with enhanced capabilities. This lets us use a bunch of additional networking protocol in addition to the legacy TFTP. Finally, and this is a relatively new feature, it contains a small tool called ISO Hybrid. ISO Hybrid post processes an ISO image. It only, it only supports uh, ISO images that, use, that uses ISO Linux. Um, it, it makes them bootable fr from what BIOS thinks is a hard drive, which includes uh, USB sticks. Now, a lot of the odd things about this ultimately comes down to the fact that the x86 PC by now is an ancient platform. I, I, I calculated out that the, P, the, the PC has existed for 45% of the entire existence of electronic computers, so almost half. The uh, original IBM 5150, um, 
came out in 1981, and a lot of the BIOS definition was all, dates back all the way to that one. There were a few more things added in the uh, IBM AT and the PS2 that are still kind of considered consider standard. This pretty much dates back from when IBM had, you know, fir firm, uh, firm leadership in the, uh, in the area. And uh, kind of after that, no, after that, um, uh, we only had floppy and hard disk booting standard. Anything else required a custom ROM for everything. Um, This kind of led to a bit of an untenable situation where you know it seemed like no one could advance the platform. And s after a few kind of missteps, there started to be cons industry consensus standards. And one of the first ones of those was the CD-ROM booting standard called El Torito, supposedly named after the restaurant where the people who came up with the standard were had dinner. Uh, it came out in 1993. Um, El Torito contains two modes. Uh, one is you have a disk image on the CD and it just boots it as if it had been a disk. And the other one is so-called native mode where you can actually access the entire CD. Unfortunately, uh, the native mode didn't work very well in many biases until the late 90s. Similarly, we had a, a network booting standard uh, originally developed by Intel, uh, came out in 19, 1997 and then revised in 1999. Some of the, er, again, some of the early code were really, really problematic there. And even today we are seeing a f fair number of bugs. But at the very least, this brought standard, standards-based network booting to the x86 platform. USB drives is the most recent collection of the, to the PC bootable zoo. They just appear as, as reg conventional disk drives, uh, at least when there aren't bugs. And unfortunately, there are still bugs in a lot of biases. There is, however, tricks that can help. The SysLinux wiki and the SysLinux mailing list have collected a fair number of tricks that Works, seems to work for a lot of people, and it's a good place to get some more information on that. So, the SysLinux project itself was, uh, came out of an overnight hacking binge that I had in 1994. I had just had a miserable experience reinstalling a machine with Linux where I found out that I needed a special kernel for, for the driver that I had. This was before modules were widely used in the Linux world. Um, and, you know, I had to boot from this floppy, which was a completely opaque object. And, you know, I didn't have another Linux machine handy. And so basically I had to give up until I could go somewhere else where there was another Linux machine. And I thought, this, is, this really sucks. Like, th th this is just wrong, you know? So I decided to go out and write a bootloader that would actually boot from a floppy that another operating system would recognize. So that you could take your, the, the, your legacy operating system, you know, that was DOS primarily back then, and actually make your Linux boot floppy, even if you have to do custom stuff. And it should look like a DOS floppy, you know, and DOS should be able to read it, DOS should be able to write it. Um, and hence, I, you know, it needed to understand the file system that was underneath. This was in contrast to Lilo, which was the dominant Linux bootloader at the time, which only, which contain, only did raw blocks, you know, didn't, actually look at file systems at all. So, for, you know, it was kind of okay. A lot of distributions adopted this for, for, for their boot floppies. Boot floppies were pretty ubiquitous that, back then. Added some features that some people liked, like on, you know, for, to, to help the distros primarily added online help support in, in the bootloader. This was kind of a revolutionary idea at the time. Um, so, kind of move on. <laughs> 
Pix Pixie comes along, and like, okay, we should have a, you know, we should be able to boot Linux off of Pixie. This, you know, this this network booting thing is good. Well, so um, I, you know, look at the uh, Pixie spec, um, and it's and the spec says that the the network boot program, which is the first stage bootloader in the Pixie scheme of things, sh should only be 32 kilobytes long. Like, wow, that's pretty restrictive. I'm going to need a pretty small bootloader. Wait, I already have a pretty small bootloader. So rather than starting over from scratch, let's take this thing that I already have and beat on it until it does roughly what I need. So um, this worked eventually. Um, and users liked it because, you know, by this time, Syslinux had kind of matured enough that it got most of the features that people, that people really depended upon in it already. And it's like suddenly you have another, pro, you know, you have another medium, you can use all the same features. It's just good. So kind of on that general note, um, I'm like, okay, this is, this is kind of cool. Um, let's, you know, ne so decided to next tackle CD-ROMs and actually be able to boot CD-ROMs in native mode. Um, this was different from, you know, the disk image variety, and the di and the reason, the motivator for it was that the disk images were getting too small; they were getting too cramped. People were already using SysLinux on the disk images, but so let's give them access to, ho to the whole to the whole disk. This became Isolinux. A few years later than that, you know, a little bit more maturing and so on. But you know, there's I, I kind of gotten this whole thing about supporting multiple file systems down reasonably well. You know, should actually and um, I should actually be able to make this so that I can use it as a general boot general purpose bootloader. Um, and that was EXT Linux. Um, in 2004, I did, apparently did quite a lot of work because that's also where the modular API and the menu system was first written. 2006, um, a lot of people were like, yeah, we like this menu system, but it's not flashy enough. So eventually, like, fine, 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 fancy graphics, we got it. And in 2008, GPixie Linux and ISO Linux hybrid support, which is the USB key, that uh, ISO image that also works in the USB key. So what's good about SysLinux? The number one thing that SysLinux does different than other bootloaders, or most other bootloaders, is that it was from the very beginning designed for dynamic systems. It was designed for floppies, after all. And on a floppy, you can't assume that you know, you're going to boot it on the same system that you originally created the floppy on. Um, but I've tried to keep true to that principle so, uh, and do system discovery at boot time. I, do, I, I try very, very hard to keep SysLinux such that you should make, be able to make almost any arbitrary reconfiguration of your system. You should be able to pull out half your hard drives, rearrange them, you know, put them in, put them in another system, whatever. It should still work, if at all possible. The other, th the other basic principle I've tried to keep true to is place nice with others. I try to stick very closely to the established principles for booting a PC, which is somewhat, they're somewhat arcane, um, and they're somewhat con con restricting. But for example, I don't support installing into the MBR, as some other bootloaders do, simply because it makes the job of dealing with other operating systems that do weird stuff harder. Uh, by now, we have a pretty sophisticated user interface, and we have, again, the modular API, which I'm going to talk more about later. Uh, what's this problem? Um, well, first of all, large, it has 
a large core of assembly code. This was, this was, a, this was useful for size, but it really has become a liability. Um, again, we're only, it's only avail available on the x86 BIOS platform, and this is pretty much because of the large assembly core. Um, well, the whole thing about playing nice with others and uh, doing dynamic discovery does come at a price, and that is um, in a lot of bootloaders you can do such things as um, you know the bootloader is installed on one dro on one disk and it will read a kernel from a file system on a on a different disk. I don't support that mostly because it's not very clear what that even means in a dynamic system. You know, you th this drive may be, you know, this drive may be drive 0 and and that drive may be drive 2 today, <laughs> but there is no guarantee that that's going to be the same the the act the case when the system is actually booted. So there are ways one can work around that. But I haven't really, I've found when, in general, when I've asked for people, well, I have this, I, I need this feature. And I, I generally want to ask them, well, why, why, do, why do you need it? What, what do you, you know, well, I'm doing this. And, and there's usually another, usually better way of doing what, what they're needed to do. Now, I'm fully willing to be convinced that this is, you know, I have too narrow of a view, but, um, this has turned out to be the case so far. Um, I want to talk a little bit about GPixie Linux uh, here because it's it's a it's a little bit of a segue, but it's kind of a it, it's kind of a cool thing. So this GPixie comes from the Etherboot project. It is GPixie. And, and, we, and we have then taken it and put it together with Pixie Linux into one image. What, uh, now, GPixie uh, provides an extended Pixie li interface, which is specifically designed for Pixie Linux. So, Pixie Linux has some special bits for GPixie, and GPixie has some special bits for Pixie Linux. You put these together, you can boot over the you know, over a variety of network protocols. Uh, currently, we're up to HTTP, FTP, NFS, ATA over Ethernet, iSCSI, FSP, and I think there are like two or three other protocols which are just too obscure for me to remember right now. Um, the goal is for this is that you should be able to uh, the goal for this was that you should be able to swap in and out um, Pixie Linux in an existing configuration and have it just work. Uh, we are about 95% there. There is one semi-obscure feature of Pixie Linux that is not supported in GPixie Linux yet, uh, but it works for the vast majority of users. Uh, this lets you do things like, well, I want to dynamically generate configuration files. Well, I can just do it. W you know, I can just put it up on Apache and, you know, do a CGI script. I know how to do that. Um, if you're doing it this way, you need you still need a TFTP server for the initial bootstrap. This is because the the pic the, t the the Pixie stack that came on your on your card only supports TFTP. Now, if you are willing to reflash your NIC and put GPixie on your NIC, then you don't even need that. So, I wanted to show a little, a, a little demo of this. And there is no safety net for this. I am going to boot a virtual machine over, over the internet from a server in California. And the only thing that is kind of local on this is this, um, th this is a C CD-ROM image that has GPixie on it. The actual GPixie image is about 64 kilobytes. 
Um, if, if you put it in a ROM, it would be a lot smaller than, than this. So this is GPixy. We'll start up, do the usual discovery. Well, it just downloaded Pixie Linux from California. It's hunting for a configuration file. This takes this takes a little bit. Yeah. So this is the act, this is the SysLinux menu system. You can have submenus and you know graphical backgrounds and all that sort of stuff. In this case, let's try to boot Tom's boot disk. Again, this is over this is from this is over HTTP from a web server in California. Now it's just booting, so I'm, I'm going to. And there we are. Now, as I mentioned, SysLinux has this module API, which is designed to be very flexible. This was actually sort of, this is kind of an, a good example on how interesting things come from unexpected places. Um, this was actually done because someone, because uh, a former colleague of mine said, can't you, um, you know, can't you support booting DOS style com uh, images? And I'm like, well, they're really easy to support. I, I'm, you know, might, might as well. Um, you know, why, why do you need it? Well, you know, this I have, um, I have this uh, this network bootloader called Netboot, which was the predecessor of the Etherboot project uh, that comes as a .com file. Okay, fine. So this was kind of sitting in there for, this was sitting in SysLinux for quite a long time and not really being used. At some point I said, well, you know, yeah, this is 16-bit COM stuff, but, you know, we should really have 32, something 32-bit in there as well, so it came up with COM32. Um, eventually kind of said, well, let's make it easier to write one of these modules and maybe someone will actually use it. So I had already written a small C library that was intended to be bundled with a Linux kernel called klibc. So I ported it to this uh, other system call interface, COM32. So what you end up with is that you have a programming environment which is basically a standard C environment. Uh, most of the stuff you expect the standard C environment to have is there. Um, the biggest thing is that, you, is that when, you, when you open a file, you, you can only do so read-only and you can only read it sequentially. There's no support for seeks. Um, this turns out to be a pretty small problem. For, for most users, uh, you, you can live with this. And the interesting part of it is that these modules don't even need to know whether or not they're booting from a, you know, you're, you're reading these files from a CD, from, you know, a hard drive, or from a network connections from across the world. 
So the most common types of modules that people have written, and this is sort of a, you know, this is a rough taxonomy and doesn't fit everything, but it's a good example of what people can and do do. Well, first of all, you obviously have user interfaces. The menu system that you already saw is implemented as a, entirely as a module. Uh, we have file format modules. This is ways to support loading new types of kernels of various sorts. Policy modules, which are, this is what I want to do in this situation so that the user doesn't have to do it for me. And diagnostic modules, hardware diagnostics mostly. User interfaces. Right now, there are, in, in bundled with the Syslinux distribution, there are, there are two different menu systems. Uh, the very first one was the complex menu system written by Morali Ganapati who was then, uh, while he was at the University of Chicago. This thing does everything. Um, I have some screenshots on it of, on my website. It, will, it does things like you can have cascading submenus and dialog boxes where setting a dialog box here changes the command line in a completely different menu and you have a little status bar at the, at the bottom of the screen showing you what you're currently doing. Uh, trust me, the, uh, yeah, like for a large site that just needs this, en this enormous flexibility as they apparently did at the University of Chicago, it, it's absolutely unbeatable. Um, the simple menu system came later. This was after People were, people were saying, well, yeah, this menu system that you have, is, it, it's really cool, but it's way too much work to configure. For most people, it really is. So the simple menu system just takes a simple file or, or set of files and, you know, pretty straightforward, just, lo you know, presents a menu and uh, not n without too much fanciness. There's a graphics library in here, which, which is designed to make the same code work for, for either a graphical console, a text console, or a serial console. The code in the menu system that you saw is the same for all three types of consoles. Um, in fact, if the graphics library, if, if that menu system had booted and found that we didn't have a, a, a graphics card that it could use, it would just have defaulted back to text mode. Similarly, if it had found that it had a serial console, it would just have used the serial console. In fact, the serial console works at the same, you know, it, it works in parallel with the display console so that you can either be a human being touching the physical console, or you can be, uh, you know, on a remote uh, terminal server somewhere else. Now, obviously, if you're using graphics features, like you're using little icons, for example, well, and you're bypassing this sort of console library, well, there's not much I can do about that. But this is, of course, allowed if you want it. File format modules are a way to, you know, it's a module that, you, that implements a new type of loadable object. Um, again, the goal has been to make these easy to write. So in order to do that, the module uh, describes where in memory things should be going. You don't actually, as the module author, have to do the work of actually putting it into the proper place. You just have to tell the rest of the library where things should be going. And then there is this thing called the shuffle library. The shuffle library looks at where things are now, where things need to be, and what scrap memory it has to play with and computes a set of move operations that will, put, that will end up with everything in the right place at the end. 
an example on this is the Microsoft system deployment image format. I had never heard of this until someone asked me, hey, I want to boot WinPE with SysLinux. It's like, okay, I don't know the first thing about WinPE. Turns out that they have this, this thing called SDI, which is roughly the equivalent of, of, roughly the equivalent of having a Linux kernel and, 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 a, and a RAM disk. Uh, it's kind of basically a Windows kernel and a RAM disk. Um, supporting this format took a module that was 199 lines of C code. 139 lines of those were, were actual lines that actually did something, including lines that have single curly braces on them. Most of that is taken up by error handling, meaning, the, you know, look at this header field. You know, this is not the right type of header field. You know, this, if this problem, then error this. If that problem, then error that. If this problem, error that. That's actually. It, you know the the end the the resulting code is 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 very small. Diagnostic modules are um, uh, modules that tell you about hard, uh, about your hardware. The um, one of the first ones was a P PCI dumper written by Erwan here. Um, now, what we have done is we've taken a lot of that dumping, the, the actual code that gets the state out, and moved it into the library so it's available to other modules. Uh, this both lets us build better diagnostic tools. In fact, some, I, I wish I could find it again because someone showed me this, this uh, kind of hardware inventory thing that's actually been written on top of SysLinux. And, then I lost track of where I found it because I hadn't even, I, I, because I hadn't seen it before. But it, um, it's some, it, it was kind of neat where you, where you could actually get like cascading windows of describing what your hardware looked like be, at pre-boot. Um, and finally, we have policy modules where an example of policy is boot, boot this kernel if I'm on a 64-bit machine, boot this other kernel if I'm on a 32-bit machine that has PAE, this is presumably high mem kernel, and otherwise boot yet another kernel. This is an example of a policy. You can tell the user to pick different menu items, but why should you have to? This is stuff that can be done automatically. It should be doable. This should be done automatically. So an, a, a module to implement this particular policy was 129 lines wrong, 70 of which were something other than blank lines or comments. Most of, the, most of that code was taken out by picking apart the command line and putting it back together again. Uh, and this is because if, if these things had been fixed, compile time constants, that, that wouldn't have been necessary, but this was meant to be a general purpose module. And sh sure, you can, you can combine things into, in, into modules that do all kinds of strange things. We have code right now that can, that can probe your PCI bus, map those devices to the corresponding modules in the Linux kernel, then build you an initRAMFS with only those, mo with those modules and no other modules, and do all of this at boot time, you know, for the system that you're booting on. This is already there, already working code. But as soon as you have that, you, 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 also, you also, you know, discover that there's always going to be limitations. Right now, for example, you ha you're starting to see a lot more devices on USB, even on FireWire and so on. And these sort of extended buses are harder to discover because you need a driver for the bus itself 
for the HBA of the bus in order to be able to further enumerate it. So the, this technique has been less useful than I was hoping it was going to be. But it's, it is there and you know, maybe someone will figure out the right way to use it. So what's happening right now, um, we're, wor uh, we're working on integrating a Lua interpreter. And the purpose of this is primarily to write policies. People really don't like having to compile a C module to, to do a new policy, and, I, and that's very understandable. So doing it as a Lua script seems like a much more useful thing. Why do we pick Lua? Well, it had a clean, relati you know, relatively small, uh, sort of uh, isolated interpreter that was, and it's a you know, clean, small language. Uh, reader support. This right now, SysLinux doesn't support actually examining directories. This is partly because over the network you can't do that. But um, on disk, it would be nice to do that. So that's work underway. The really big one is to is to get rid of all this legacy assembly code. First of all, the first thing that needs to happen is that file system code just needs to move out of assembly. Um, the implementing something like BTRFS um, in assembly would be just a nightmare. But even getting rid of the rest of the code from assembly would, is going to be important to make this ever port beyond the x86 BIOS platform. In particular, uh, for EFI, x86 EFI, which is becoming a, a, a more important platform, this needs, this needs to happen. And at this point, a lot, some of the groundwork is happening, but, there's a, but the actual work is, is still upcoming. This is what the core looks like, right? This is the components of the core as of right now. Um, the first stage loader, disk and network I.O., and the, uh, the BIOS extender, which is what allows us to get into protected mode, and the shuffle system, that is the part that makes all the memory magically end up where it should be at the end. All of these are kind of core platform support things, and they will always need to be in assembly, if nothing else, for size. However, the rest, command line interface, config file parser, uh, the, kernel, the kernel loader and parser, uh, and more, most important of all, the file system drivers really have no business doing this, and it needs to be rewritten in C. This is about 80 to 85 percent of the size of the current core. So the part on the left that is always going to have to be assembly code is really a very small portion. So why hasn't a lot of this happened before? Well, it really kind of comes down to the fact that it is getting to be too large for it to be a one-person side project, which it really was until a couple of years ago. Now, uh, we really, over the last few years, I am absolutely delighted how many people have kind of come in, and we're starting to form a real development community. And we can always use more developers. And in addition to actually writing code, things like help, helping newbies, there are so many things that can be done in the booting space in so many ways. And just and honestly, I have to say, if there's anything in SysLinux I'm ashamed of, it's the documentation. The state of the documentation is just miserable. Uh, but again. Doing the core rewrite, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of work. And so it really, you know, in, in addition to me, that it really, you know, need, we need other people. Now, also, all of this really only makes sense if the users want it. You know, we can build the coolest piece of technology in the world, 
and if no one uses it, it doesn't matter. So we need to make sure that we end up building something that people actually want to use. That makes sense for users, makes sense for administrators, makes sense for distros. So feedback is always welcome. And this is where you can find the more information as well as these slides. And at that, I, I wonder, uh, wonder if we have any questions. Yes. I'm sorry? So, so the question was whether or not we can check a cryptographic hash of, of what, what we download off the internet. Um, right now, there is support in, in gpixy for HTTPS. The problem is that at boot time, you don't, have a, you don't have any sort of random number generator available to you. The, this means that the security you get is pretty weak because most authentication schemes rely on having a random number generated available. Um, could we do something, uh, you, you're specifically asked if we could check a hash of what, what is there. It's certainly something that we could do relatively easily, but you also have to ask the, the question then, where do you get the, the hash to compare it from to? This is a lot, there are a lot of issues when it comes to, the, uh, when it comes to that in the booting space is you, you, people really want to make the boot more, sec more secure, but then you kind of have to ask the next question is, how do I know my security works? Um, I, think, I think we may be able to, to make the HTTPS support better. Uh, it it's, hasn't been a huge priority for, for, for the uh, GPixie people at the, at the moment, but um, we, probably, we, we, we probably can make that better, if, if not perfect. Um, why, why don't we use the hardware TPM environment to do that? Um, that's actually probably the answer. Uh, right, now, right now, TPMs are, um, you know, not, they're, they're the, their availability is somewhat spotty, but that is, of course, changing. So the TPM, if nothing else, should be a, should be a, if we can find the TPM and straighten out the fact that there is at least four different hardware protocols involved, um, it, at least they should provide us with a reliable random number generator and, and possibly secure storage for things like keys and stuff like that. So. It's 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 actually the right way to do that. Uh, the question I believe is: Do we support IPv6? Or is 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 that what I heard? Okay, so the question is, do we support IPv6 or, or, or only IPv4? Uh, right now, we only support IPv4. IP, uh, IPv6 is not supported by the Pixie standard. Um, the uh, GPixie people are working on it, but we end up with a funny notion of how do we, you know, what does it mean for us to support IPv6, uh, given the fact that the underlying protocols we use don't. Um, for the parts of the Pixie spec that are, uh, that are a in, you know, the on the local machine sort of protocols, we can, we, we can deal with that, but, the, but it also includes some over the, over the wire uh, components. Uh, there is a Pixie spec for, IP, uh, for IPv6 under development. Unfortunately, Microsoft is heavily involved in it, and therefore I have not, you know, you know, it's, it, they're, they're basically keeping it 
away from the open source people. So I have no idea what, what it even is going to look like. And uh, to be honest with you, if it ends l up looking as bad as the original pi Pixie spec, I don't have, you know, it's, it's going to be another nightmare. <laughs> Uh, so the question was if I can talk more about building an initial RAM disk. Um, so the question is, where do you get modules? Are you allowed to use GCC? No, uh, we don't have GCC ported to the Sys Linux. DCC. I'm sorry. Oh, DJGCC. No, okay. Okay, I, 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 I don't believe I'm familiar with it. Uh, but okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's a GCC uh, thing. Um, the answer, uh, well, the, the answer on the module front is that the normal thing is that the modules will actually be already compiled on disk. Um, I, could you, I mean, I'm sure that we probably actually could build an environment where you could compile a module on the fly. Um, it's, you know, there's no technical reason why it's not possible. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's probably not, it, it's probably not the most effective way of doing that, but, um, uh, but we can, as I said, we can take files, we can generate files, we can take files and, and put them in a NITRAMFS. We can uh, also generate file contents and put them in NITRAMFS. So all, all the pieces are there, certainly. Uh, the question is if there's support for, for boot, boot ones. Yes, there is. Uh, right now it's only in EXT Linux, but that's, uh, that's a fixable problem. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, then. I think we're done. And